intimidated by regular expressions? I know. I know. Uh, has anyone else here felt intimidated by regular expressions? I, I see a lot of hands going up. You are not alone. I used to look at a regular expression like this and feel a sense of dread in my heart. I knew there had to be meaning in it somewhere, but it frankly looked like a message left by the lost civilization of Atlantis. This is actually a regex that validates Visa credit card numbers. Now, once I knew that context, I could kind of see some clues, kind of get a sense for what was going on, but I had no idea how I'd ever write something like this. It's human nature to fear what we don't understand. Now, it took time, but once I understood how a regular expression actually works, how it actually finds that match in the string, I realized it's not something from Atlantis. It's simply a process, a logical process that I could grasp. Then I knew how to use a regular expression without fear, to harness their power to match exactly what I wanted to in exactly the way I wanted it to. I'm here today to share this knowledge with you, to help you move beyond your fear of regular expressions. When it comes to regular expressions, knowledge truly is power. Today, I'm here to show you how this power can be yours. Ruby and regular expressions work together in a harmony, in a symphony of code. If I were to learn regex anywhere, I say regex, some people say regex, neither is right or wrong, they're just different ways of saying the same thing. I'm glad I learned them in Ruby. What we see in Ruby, however, when we call that match method or use that equal sign tilde match operator is just the tip of a very large iceberg. A lot more goes on beneath the surface in the Onigno regular expressions engine. Let's take a journey beneath that surface. The Onigno regular expression engine was introduced in Ruby 2.0. Ruby passes regular expressions and strings to this engine, and this engine handles the actual matching. Now, Enigma is actually a fork of Onigurama, the regex engine that was used in Ruby 1.9. Both of these engines provide all the standard regex features you'll find in any regex engine, but these two handle multi-byte characters, such as Japanese text, particularly well. Now, Onigma was forked from Onigurama to add some regular expression features that were introduced with Perl 5.10. Now, when I started to explore how Onigma and Onigurama actually work, I came across an article pa by Patrick Shaughnessy titled, Exploring Ruby's Regular Expression Algorithm. At the end, on my ending slide, as well as tweeting it after this presentation, I'll include a link to the list of resources I used when putting this presentation together. Please check out his article, it's fantastic. So when Ruby first passes a regex to Onigmo, Onigmo reads that regex, then parses it into an abstract syntax tree. An abstract syntax tree simply represents some code, in our case a regular expression, in a tree form that's easier for Onigmo to compile into a series of instructions. These instructions tell the engine how to execute that match. Now these instructions can be represented by a finite state machine. Now, what on earth is that? A finite state machine is a mathematical model that shows how something works. It's sort of like a diagram or a map that shows how something gets from one state to another state. Now, this will be clear with an example, so let's create one. I'm going to first create a finite state machine that represents a dog. Specifically, my parents' dog, Annie. She's a very cute Whippet Irish, Whip Irish Terrier mix and, like most dogs, loves to go in and out of the house several times every day. Now, each of these two circles, these nodes, represent a state that Annie can be in at any given time. She can either be in the state of being in the house or she can be in the state of being out of the house. So how does she get from one state to the other? Well, she's, being, she's in the state of being in the house, she can go through her doggy door and be in the state of being out of the house. Now, when she gets bored outside, she can go through that doggy door again and be in the state of being in the house. So that's an example of a finite state machine. 
But even as an example of just those words, finite state machine are still quite a mouthful. Let's break it down. The machine is what I'm modeling. In this example, it was Annie the dog. State means we're modeling states that model can be in. Now, in the case of Annie, she can either be in the house or she can be out of the house. Finite means there are a limited number of states our machine can be in. Now, states are often limited by physical reality. Annie really can't suddenly be in space or under the ocean as much as she might like to try. In a computer, memory is not infinite. There's only so much it can process before it crashes. Therefore, the number of states a computer process, like a regular expression can be in, is limited by the physical memory. Now, before I move on, I should mention that, like most dogs, Annie loves to stand halfway in the house and halfway out of the house at the same time. Now, at these points, she's actually in multiple states. There are ways a computer process, such as a regex match, can be in multiple states at the same time. Now, it's out of the scope of this presentation, but in the resources list, I include a link to the article, Regular Expression Matching Can Be Fun and Fast by Russ Cox. This goes into depth into an algorithm called Thompson's algorithm that allows for this in regex. If you're interested, I highly recommend checking it out. So this time, let's make a finite state machine for a regex. This regex looks for the word force in any string I pass to it. So in Ruby, I'm going to declare my regular expression. Then I'm going, going to declare my string, which is use the force. Then I'm going to call match on my regex and pass it that string. Olivia will read the regex, parse it into that abstract syntax tree, compile it into those instructions. And its finite state machine looks like this. Now, a regular expression tries to match a string one character at a time, starting with the very first character of the string. So the first character this regex sees is the capital letter U. Now, that doesn't match the path to the next state. It would need a lowercase f to do that. So it stays on that starting state. Now, next, it sees the lowercase letter s. Still doesn't match, so it still doesn't match, move from that starting state. Let's fast forward a bit, because it's going to do it for each of these characters until we get to that lowercase f. Now, this is where things start to get interesting. That lowercase f matches the path to the next state. So my regex moves on, and then it sees the lowercase o in the string. And sure enough, that matches the path to the very next state. Same thing happens with the r, with the c, with the e, and we have a match. When it, when it gets to that final matching state, Onigo tells Ruby that the regex match was successful. So back in Ruby, I'll get back a match data object containing the portion of my string that matched. In this case, it was the word force. Now, that was a pretty simple example. Let's try something a little more complicated. Let's try a regular expression that uses alternation. This regular expression will match the capital letter Y, followed by either the characters O-L-K or the characters O-D-A. I'm providing two alternate ways my regex can match the string. So once again, I'll declare my regex, declare my string, which is the word Yoda, then call matching that regex and pass it the string. And this time, my finite state machine looks a little bit different. There are two paths that can lead to a successful match. So after it matches that capital Y at the beginning of the string, it now has to make a choice. It sees that lowercase o, but there are two paths that it can take. Which should it try first? In the case of alternation, the regex engine will always try the leftmost alternate first. But before it moves to that OLK path, it saves both the point in the string and the state it's on to what's called the backtrack stack. Every time my regex chooses one path over the other, it saves the string and the state just in case the match fails and it needs to try the other choice. It's marking a place it can come back to. And it's a good thing it did. As soon as it sees that D in my string, it has no way to get from its current state to the finishing matching state. 
Now, normally, having no path from the current state to the finishing state would cause the regex to fail. However, because it has something in that backtrack stack, it can backtrack back to the point where it shows which path to follow and try the other one. This time, things go much better. After it matches the O, it's next able to match the D and the A, and once again, we have a match. Back in Ruby, I'll get back my match data object, and it matched the whole string this time, the word Yoda. Now, finite state machines become even more interesting when we add quantifiers to the equation. Now, it's easy to look at this regular expression with our human minds and see the word no followed by a plus sign. That's not the way Omigno looks at a regular expression, though. It will see this as the capital letter N followed by the lowercase letter O and a plus sign quantifier. Now, that plus sign means the O has to appear one or more times. So in Ruby, I'll declare my regex and my string. This time, the string is the word no, famously yelled by Luke Skywalker during The Empire Strikes Back. <laughs> now, I'm going to call the match on my regex and pass it the string. And this is what my finite state machine looks like. Now, it's pretty simple at first. It matches that capital letter N with ease. Then it matches that first O. And now my regex has a dilemma. Technically, it has a successful match here. But it sees another lowercase o in the string. It can either return the match here or keep matching o's and match more of the string. So which should it choose? Well, that plus sign by default is a greedy quantifier. A greedy quantifier will always keep looping as long as there is more string to match. Greedy quantifiers match as much of the string as they can get their greedy little arms around. Even if they technically have a successful match, they will always be hungry for more. A greedy quantifier uses maximum effort for maximum return. It will try every permutation of the regex and the string to get the biggest match possible. So it's going to just keep looping and match that third O, then the fourth O. And now it comes to the last O in the string, and then we have a match. Back in Ruby, I'll get back that match data object, and it's known with all five of those O's. But what if I want to do the opposite of this? What if I want to not keep looping? I want to match as little of that string as possible. I would use a lazy quantifier. Lazy quantifiers do the exact opposite of greedy quantifiers. They match as little of the string as they can possibly get away from it, away with. Lazy quantifiers use minimum effort for minimum return. They're lazy. They do just enough to get the job done, and then they quit. I make a quantifier lazy by adding a question mark right after it. Now, that plus sign is still a quantifier. But the question mark is a modifier on that quantifier that makes it lazy. In Ruby, I'll do the same thing, declare my regex, declare my string, call match on it. And my, in, my finite state machine is going to first start out the same. It's going to match that capital N, followed by the lowercase o, and then it's come, going to come to that same point and have the same dilemma. Should it keep looping and match more of the string? Or should it return the match here? Well, a greedy quantifier, or pardon me, a lazy quantifier will always choose to return the match rather than keep on looping. So in Ruby, I'm going to get back my match data object, and this time it contains the word no with only one O. This choice, whether to just keep looping or to return the match as soon as it has a viable one, is the essence of greedy and lazy quantifiers. The difference between them is that a greedy quantifier will always choose to keep looping. A lazy quantifier will always return the match as soon as it has a viable one. Now, even though greedy quantifiers are greedy, they're also reasonable. If a greedy quantifier matches an extra character, but then that character is later, later needed late, pardon me, if that character is needed later in the regex to make a successful match, it will give that character back. It will always choose making an overall match over holding on to any extra characters. So let's look at another example. This time I'm going to use the star quantifier. 
Now, I should say briefly that you need to use the star quantifier with caution. The star quantifier will match the character, it's the character before it, which in this case is the dot character, which matches any character. The star quantifier will match that character appearing any number of times. Any number of times includes zero times. And since that dot character can match any character, this regex will match any character appearing any number of times, followed by the word moon. So in Ruby, I declare my regex, declare my string. This time it's the line, that's no moon. Call match on that regex and pass it the string. In my finite state machine, the first character the string is going to see is that capital letter T. Now that matches the dot meta character path, so it moves on to the next state. Now when it's at this state, there are two paths it can take. If it matches an M, it can move on to that next state. Or if it matches any character at all, it matches that dot character, it can follow that path and loop back into itself. So that H is going to match that any character, so it loops. Then it sees that lowercase a, and it does the same thing. Now this will continue throughout the string until here, when it starts to get interesting. My regex sees that lowercase m, and now it has a dilemma. That m does match the any character path, but it also matches the m path to the next state. So which should it choose? Remember, that quantifier uh, that, that quantifier made that dot character greedy. So it's going to keep on looping over that any character path. It does this again for the O, then the next O, then the N, and uh-oh. There are no more characters left in my, for my, in my string for my regex to match. Now it's still not at that finishing matching state. So now it has a choice to make. It can backtrack and give back some of those characters, or it can go ahead and declare the match a failure. Now remember, greedy quantifiers are reasonable. So that star quantifier is going to surrender some of the characters it matched, starting with the most recent one, last in, first out. So it surrenders that N, but that doesn't make things any, any better yet. So it tries that O, Still no match for the path to the next state. And tries that next O and things are looking grim. But then it sees that lowercase m and we have a match. A match for the next state at least. It can move on to that next state. Then it sees that O, it matches that O. Then the next O. Then the N. And then we have a match. Back in Ruby, I'll get back my match data object. And it's the entire string, that's no moon. Now with backtracking, I was able to get a successful match. But backtracking tends to be slow. And it uses up a lot of memory. When you hear someone complaining about how slow regular expressions are, chances are they're complaining about backtracking. Now it's great when, like in the previous example, backtracking lets my regex find a match. But when it doesn't find a match, when that match fails, all that backtracking work is for nothing. Let's look at another example. This regex will match the capital letter N, followed by an O appearing one or more times, followed by a W appearing one or more times. I'll declare that regex. I'll go back to using the string no. I'll call match on that regex and pass it the string. And in my finite state machine, it's going to match that capital letter N pretty fast. Then I'll match the lowercase O. And that plus sign after the lowercase o is greedy, so it's going to keep on matching those o's. Match it again, and again, and again, until it gets to the end of the string. And once again, I have the end of the string, and I have no more characters left to match. It has no match for that w appearing one or more times. Now, it can either fail the match now, or it can try to backtrack. Since it's a greedy quantifier, it will backtrack, looking for that W earlier in the string. It'll give back that O, then the next O, and then the next O until it gets to here. That's the last O it can backtrack to. And now there's definitely no way it can make a match, so the match fails. Now that backtracking was a lot of extra effort for something that was ultimately going to fail. Now sometimes that effort is worth it. 
But when it's not, there's a third kind of quantifier that lets you control the backtracking in your regex. It's called a possessive quantifier. Possessive quantifiers do not backtrack. These are all or nothing. It either makes a match on the first try or it fails the regex. Let's look at an example. I'm going to modify my regex by adding a plus sign after that W plus sign characters. So I have my W, that's the character I'm trying to match. Then the first plus sign means it's going to match one or more occurrences of the letter W. And that second plus sign is a modifier on the first plus sign. This modifier makes that quantifier possessive. So back in my finite state machines, machine, these are first going to happen exactly like they did with the previous regex. It's going to match that N and that lowercase O and the next lowercase O all the way to the end of that string. And then, uh-oh, I've got no more characters to match. Now, should I either backtrack and look for that W appearing one more times, or should it fail? A possessive quantifier will choose to fail the match rather than backtrack and try again. Possessive quantifiers save both time and memory by failing faster. You use a possessive quantifier when you know there's a point in your regex where backtracking would be pointless. The match is going to fail no matter how many times it tries other permutations through backtracking. Now use these with caution. These can potentially cause unexpected failures in your regex if you're not careful. But when used carefully, they can significantly speed up a regular expression, particularly when you start to get into nested quantifiers. Now, so far, I've taken you through the bits and pieces of how a regex works. This is great information to know and good theory to have in your mind. But that doesn't explain how to practically use a regex in your everyday code. Crafting a regular expression for a specific need is as much an art as a science. In this last section, I'm going to take you through crafting a regular expression from scratch for use in real functioning code. Now, back in May, Audrey Bloom tweeted a regular expression challenge. It was to create some Ruby code that would use the GSUM method and a regex to convert a snake case string into a camel case string. Now, I was away on vacation and unplugged at the time this was posted, so I didn't see it until sometime later. I'd like to present my solution now, and I'd like to take you step by step through how I developed it. First thing I did was to whiteboard some requirements for my solution. To convert a snake case string to a camel case string, my solution first needs to find the first letter of the string and capitalize it. Then it needs to find any character that directly follows an underscore and capitalize that character. Finally, it needs to remove all underscores from the string. These steps will transform a snake case string into a camel case string. So let's start with that first step. I need to find the first letter of the string and capitalize it. Now, I'm a test-driven developer. So I develop my regular expressions through the same red-green refactor process. Uh, my wife recently quipped that uh, test today is a bug avoided tomorrow. So in this spec, I define the basic structure of my program. I'm creating a class called case converter. Then I'm going to add a method to that class called upcase cars. I expect that when I pass that method a lowercase string, uh, it will return that same string with the, cap with the first character capitalized. So next step is to draft a regular expression to match that first character in my string. I use this caret symbol, symbol to anchor my match to the beginning of the string. And in this first draft, I use the shorthand slash w, which matches any word character, to find the first character in my string. So I'm going to plug this into some code, my upcase cars method. I define my regex, then call g sub on the string that was passed to upcase cars, pass it that regex, and then any match that regex, fi regex finds, I tell it to capitalize that character. So I'm going to run my spec, and my spec passes. But there's a problem with this regex. I want to capitalize the first letter in my string, even if there's an underscore in front of it. 
Now in this spec, I state that when I pass the string underscore method to the upcase cars method, I expect to receive the string back with the first letter capitalized. Now when I run this with my current code, my spec fails. Let's take a look at the error message from that spec. It expected underscore capital M method, but it got back underscore lowercase m method. Something's not right. The problem with the slash w shorthand is that it does what it says, it matches all word characters, but in Renix land, all word characters includes all capital letters, all lowercase letters, and underscores. So when I pass it a string that contains an underscore, it's going to match the underscore. My code will then call, call upcase on the underscore, and naturally nothing's going to happen. You can't upcase an underscore. So I need to be more specific. Instead of the slash w shorthand, I'm going to use a character class. This character class will match any lowercase letter from A to Z. That's exactly what I need to capitalize and nothing more. Furthermore, I'm going to allow for one non-lowercase character at my string, in my str at the beginning of my string. In my example, is an underscore. Now that character in the character class is different from the character at the begin. Pardon me. Is different from the caret at the beginning of my regular expression. When it's in a character class, it negates that character class. So this character class will match everything but lowercase letters. I'm then going to add a question mark after that character class to make it optional. This means this regex will match a string with an underscore at the beginning of it or a string without an underscore at the beginning of it. And when I plug that regex into my code, run my spec, my spec now passes. I can move on to the next requirement for that solution. Find any character that follows an underscore and capitalize that character. So once again, I'm going to define a spec. I expect that when I pass the string some underscore method with all lowercase letters, it will return that same string with the S and the M capitalized. Now to draft a regular expression that does this, I need a regex that will match both the first lowercase letter in the string and any lowercase letter following an underscore. So I take my current regex and I add an alternate to it. This will now, now match the first lowercase letter of a string or any other lowercase letter in the string. Now I need to make that more specific, so I add in a look behind. This look behind will match any underscore in my string. What a look behind does is it defines a context for that character class. Now that, that alternate, that second alternate, will only match a lowercase letter if it directly follows an underscore. I plug that regex into my code and run my spec, and my spec passes. Now I can move on to the final requirement. Remove any underscores from my string. I define my spec, and I'm going to use a new method this time. The method called creatively, I suppose, remove underscores. I expect that when I pass it the string some underscore method, it will return that same string with the underscore removed. Now the regex I need for this method is actually pretty easy. I simply need to find any literal underscore in my string. It's nice when they're that easy. So I create my method, remove underscores, and I declare my regex, just matching an underscore, call g sub on my string, pass it that regex and an empty string. This tells g sub for any match it finds for that regex, substitute an empty string for it. Effectively, this is deleting that character from the string. I run my spec, and my spec passes. Now I want to combine the results of those two methods into one method that I can call. I create another spec. This one is for a method called snake to camel. This is the method that's going to define everything together. I expect that when I provide a string, some underscore method, I will get back the string with the S and the M capitalized and with the underscore removed. I'm going to define that method, snake to camel, pass it that string, 
And first, I'm going to call upcase cars on that string. Then I'm going to call remove underscores on the result of upcase cars. I run my spec, and my spec passes. The code for this is available here. GitHub.com slash NelsChamRel slash snake underscore two underscore camel underscore case. I'll tweet out a link to that after the presentation. Life with regex is a journey. It's a journey that's first fraught with peril, but it becomes much easier as you learn and understand what happens beneath the surface. Here are a few tips to help you along your way. Powerful, elegant regular expressions aren't developed all at once. Develop your regex in small pieces. Make sure those individual pieces work, then combine them into that larger regular expression. When you write a regular expression, you're writing a program in another language. You're writing to a process, the language of the regular expression engine. Like any program, regex need to be developed iteratively. They come in drafts. Whenever I'm crafting a regular expression for use in Ruby, I first develop it in Rubular. Rubular is a fantastic site that allows you to easily create and test regular expressions against test strings. It's an extremely valuable tool. Now, a tip I picked up from Myron Marston on the Rogues Parlor list is to make a permalink of any regex I develop in Rubular and paste it into a comment in my code. I've used this in my day-to-day -day work for some time now, and it's helped immensely whenever I've needed to come back to a regular expression. I highly recommend it. Regular expressions are a programming language of their own. Like any programming language, they can be learned. They might look like a message from the lost civilization of Atlantis, but they're actually a logical system and process. At their core, they're no different from any program that takes in an input and returns a result. Regular expressions are powerful. So powerful, they inspire fear in many of us. But that fear can be overcome through understanding. Fire up Rubular. Experiment with some lazy, greedy, and possessive quantifiers. Play with regular expressions. Have fun with them. Move past your fear and take a dive beneath the surface. I think you'll be amazed at what you'll find. I'm Mel Shamrell. I'm a software development engineer with Blue Box Inc. That's my Twitter handle. That's also a link to a gist, which lists all the resources that I used preparing this presentation. There are a lot of them, and they were all fantastic. I'll tweet that out after the presentation as well. Thank you. Thank you.